Okay, well, hello everyone and welcome to our inaugural seminar for the Life RCN seminar series. Uh, my name is Jaime Cordova. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and I'm part of the uh, early career uh, researcher team, uh, part of the Life of Research Coordination Network. Uh, we're very proud to bring you this uh, seminar series today. We are very proud to bring you this seminar, uh, this seminar series. Uh, and just if you're not familiar, so LIFE is a network of astrobiologists focused on the co-evolution of Earth and life. Uh, and together we explore ways to advance the science and its implications for the search of life or search for life on other worlds. The LIFE RCN program or the LIFE RCN started uh, recently uh, within the past couple of months. Uh, and we're very excited to be uh, part of the uh, research coordination networks. Uh, through NASA Astrobiology. Uh, just to, so everyone's familiar, and as you may have seen in these slides that are going on right now, uh, everyone is unmuted and everyone's video is turned off. Uh, we ask that you please do not take any pictures of uh, any individual participants that are uh, taking place. Um, we will have uh, time for uh, questions and answers at the end. Um, so what we'll do is we'll have you uh, share those in the chat as we go along, or uh, if you want to save them towards the end, um, and we'll ask all those questions to our for our speaker at the end. Um, so if there are uh, no questions from anyone, uh, or if there are questions, please feel free to share them in the chat, um, and we'll be happy to try and answer them. Um, uh, there is a team of us from the early career researchers uh, who are here to try and help uh, with answering any questions for today's summer. Uh, in addition, oh, so our seminar series, so today is the inaugural seminar, um, but our seminar series will be monthly and we are aiming to have that uh, at least, or I'm sorry, we are aiming to have that on the first Monday of every month at the same time. Uh, so 1 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Uh, UTC. Uh, in addition, uh, or I'm sorry, that's for the most part, there are a couple of uh, days where the, the uh, first Monday of the month ends up on a holiday. So we'll uh, we've changed those accordingly and you will, because you've registered, you'll receive uh, those announcements as we get closer to those dates. Uh, but without further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Our speaker today is Dr. Tori Holer. Um, he is a research scientist uh, in the exobiology branch at NASA Ames Research Center. He received his bachelor's in chemistry uh, with highest honors and highest distinction from the University of North Carolina. Then he stayed in, at the University of North Carolina to complete his PhD in marine chemistry and biogeochemistry in 1998. Uh, in his time at NASA Ames, he's been a part of two missions. So as a uh, collaborating research scientist for the Mars Science Laboratory and as part of the science definition team for the Europa Lander. His research interests uh, are in microbial ecology and biogeochemistry with an emphasis on anaerobic processes, hydrogen cycling and bioenergetics. Uh, in addition to subsurface and low energy ecosystems. And finally, uh, his research interests also lie in planetary habitability. Uh, today, Dr. Holler will be talking to us about the metabolic rate of the biosphere and its components. And with that, I'll go ahead and pass on the screen sharing to Dr. Holler. Take it away. Awesome, thanks, thanks so much for the introduction. Um, let me see if I can pass the first test and share my screen with all of you. Um, do you see something that looks like a slide presentation? Yes, we do. Awesome. Okay. Um, now, if only I can actually share it. Hang on, bear with me one sec. Um, it does not want to. Doesn't want to start. Um, give me just one sec. I'm going to stop sharing and try again. No problem. And again, as I mentioned, everyone, so there are a team of us here. If you are having any technical difficulties or anything like that, uh, we're happy to, uh, to assist with anything that we can. Um, and in addition, if you have any questions regarding the seminar series or regarding uh, uh, today's the seminar, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, there's a team of us here on uh, who are uh, here to help you. Okay. Um, well, it looks like I'm not going to be able to actually um, give it in presenter view, but hopefully this will work almost as well. Okay. So, um, so uh, as Jaime said, the talk is about the metabolic rate of the biosphere and its components. 
this is uh, this is the subject of a paper that should be out in just a few weeks with the co-authors that you see below. And I decided to start with this title slide because to me, so what you're seeing here is a five year remote sex sensing record from, um, from our earth science colleagues at NASA um, that really presents the biosphere almost as a living, breathing organism. And I love to be able to think of it that way. Um, it's an organism where we can speak on a planet scale about the, the rate of metabolism in the biosphere. It's also to me a reminder of something special about our world, which is that we have such a, a flow of resources through our system um, that we can actually make and unmake our biosphere on relatively short time frames. So we turn over the entire standing biomass of marine primary producers. In about four days, we turn over the entire standing biomass of the biosphere on a time scale of less than a decade. And I think this really colors the way that we um, think about life on our planet and the ability to, to detect life elsewhere. Um, but of course, we are unique in many ways, and that's largely going to be the subject matter of this talk. So um, when Jaime reached out, I decided that I should go and learn a little bit about the, the Life RCN network. And I found this statement um, that this is the only planet known to harbor life. If we can't understand it here, how can we look for it elsewhere? Um, and this is really exactly the way that... Um, that I think about things. So I always ask myself three questions um, when I'm thinking about habitability or, or life detection on a body beyond Earth. And the first is, is the one that you just heard. Um, how does it look on Earth and, and why does it look that way? Are there aspects of, of how the biological system on Earth works that are fundamental and therefore transposable in the way that we think about habitability and life detection on other worlds? And then with respect to these places beyond Earth, what's different there than it is on Earth and how will that matter to life? And so I really, with regard to the second question, what aspects of biology are fundamental and transposable? I focused a lot of my research on the idea that all life requires energy. Um, you know, it's a, it's a universal requirement for life and therefore something that was applicable everywhere. It's also in many cases a quantifiable requirement. We understand how to quantify flows of energy and life's utilization energy. And for me, that represents a toehold on, think, on, on thinking about how life might work elsewhere. And I think it's intuitive that life requires energy to build new biomass. You're putting together more complicated components from relatively simple things. But of course, we also require energy simply to maintain standing biomass. And if you think about yourself, uh, you're a great example of this. So, so taking me, for example, I've consumed about uh, 100 megajoules of energy since I was 18 years old, but I really haven't grown. Um, I've, I've required all that energy simply to maintain a standing version of me. And so this suggests that there's a relationship between energy availability and standing biomass. And that's really going to be the, um, the focus of this talk. So here's one significant difference. What's, what's different elsewhere and why does it matter? The difference of course, is that on earth, um, we have tons of light energy pouring directly into a liquid water habitat. And that dramatically influences the nature of the biosphere we have. That certainly will not be true in any of the other habitable environments in our solar system, um, at least the liquid water, water bearing ones. So for example, subsurface environments on Mars, or on the ice covered moons of the outer solar system. And this has a very quantifiable impact on the availability of energy. So as part of this little study, we tried to quantify both the energy available to Earth's biosphere um, through photosynthetic energy capture, and also the energy available to Earth's biosphere simply from, from the planet itself, from geochemical sources. And so um, if you can see my cursor here, uh, we're bathed in solar energy, of course. We receive about 85,000 terawatts at the surface of the oceans. Marine primary product, uh, producers use a few percent of that. So we capture on the order of 1,200 terawatts of energy into primary production. Um, if that energy source was not available and all you had to go on was the flux of reducing material from hydrothermal vents, the, the stuff that gives us these um, amazing little ecosystems at the seabed, hydrogen sulfide and methane and hydrogen and so on. Um, if you took all of that reductant flux into the ocean and allowed it to be respired aerobically, that is with oxygen, um, that would be worth about 
terawatts of energy, about 40,000 times less energy that is captured into photosynthesis. And that has to have implications for the nature and size of the biosphere uh, that can be supported in the absence of photosynthesis. And that point certainly was not lost on the authors of the recent Planetary Science and Astrobiology Decadal Survey. They addressed two of their key science questions to, to understanding this distinction. The first of them um, asks about how biological potential, so meaning the abundance of life, the productivity, the diversity of life, um, how does it differ in light dependent ecosystems versus light independent ones, something like the comparison that, that I just made. And the second asks more directly, how do nutrient and energy flux affect metabolic and biosynthetic rates? And how does that impact the way that we should think about biosignature um, detectability on other worlds? And so this is really the subject of, of this paper and this talk is how do we address ourselves to this? So it, it's a very simple question that I'm asking and, and it's a simple question um, that the decadal is asking, which is simply how do we equate energy flux to the quantity of biomass that can be supported by that flux? And here's where I look back to earth. I wanna understand how it looks, how it works on earth and why as an empirical point of reference for understanding how it might, or how it might work elsewhere. And so um, here at the top, you see really the, the, the fundamental kernel of what this talk is all about. It's very simple in concept. All I'm doing is looking at individual organisms, components of the biosphere, the entire biosphere, and asking how much energy is flowing through that organism or those organisms? What is the biomass of those organisms? So how much energy supports how much biomass? And if you take the ratio of the two energy flux to biomass, you get something that I call mass specific power. So watts per gram of, of organism or per gram of carbon biomass. Um, I'm gonna to refer to this quantity mass specific power or MSP again and again throughout the course of the talk. So I think you can ask this question, how much energy supports how much biomass at either of two different levels. And the first is to consider the level of individual organisms, you or me or a hamster or a, a giraffe or whatever else. And in doing that, if we look across the entire tree of life, we can take a measure of the full scope of physiological potential with respect to energy transduction. What's the absolute minimum that an organism can process in terms of energy and still get by? What's the maximum that an organism can process? Are there rates that we can think of as typical across the tree of life? Second though, and more importantly, I think for the purposes of this talk, we can think about energy metabolism at the level of the entire biosphere and its major components. And now we're asking, how is the collective physiological potential of those individual organisms expressed in a diversity of natural systems where organisms are born, live and die, are chased, um, you know, evade capture, deal with less than ideal environmental um, uh, conditions? How does all of this play out on a planet-wide scale? And so that's really the, the purpose and the core of this talk. So let me first ask this question at the level of individual organisms. And it turns out that there's a very rich literature that's dedicated to measuring metabolic rates of organisms, and in many cases, referencing them, comparing them to the mass of those organisms. So what you see here is as comprehensive uh, a collection of these rate measurements as we could amass. This is about um, 10,500 individual rate measurements representing more than 2,900 species. Um, and if you array these rates, so here's basal metabolic rate uh, measured in watts on the y-axis, I'll note that this is a log scale against biomass carbon on this axis, again, as a log scale. So these 2,900 plus species span about 22 orders of magnitude in biomass. And if you fit a power law um, to these data, what you see is that the exponent here is very close to one, meaning that that um, metabolic rate scales almost linearly with mass. And that's a little bit interesting, a little bit unusual, because if you note, there are many individual trend lines here along the way, and it's quite commonly observed that within specific taxa, so fish or insects or mammals, for example, um, metabolic rate scales less than linearly. So the exponent is often closer to uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, something like that. But across the entire tree of life, there's very little mass dependence of metabolic rate. Um, so 
One thing to point out, a couple of things to point out is I see this as an empirical point of reference for trying to understand how things work at the level of the entire biosphere. But there are two things that make that a little bit challenging. And first is you'll notice there's a real clustering of points here. And that's because the vast majority of literature on metabolic rates has been dedicated to animal physiology. So, so animals are heavily overrepresented in this data set, um, which is simply meant to, to be a representative sampling of what appears in the literature. The other is these rates are often measured in a very specific way as basal metabolic rates. And, and what that means is the organism um, is, has, has food withheld from it. Often it's, it's kept immobile, kept from exercising. Um, if you're a person, they try not to let you think too much because that requires energy. So this is really asking what's the bare minimum of energy transduction in an organism. But of course in nature, it works very much differently. We move, we reproduce, we do all kinds of things that demand extra energy. So um, those two things I think are important to, to bear in mind. And in particular, regarding the, the concentration on animals in these plots, um, animals represent a tiny fraction of the biomass on our planet, which instead is dominated by trees and microorganisms. Animals account for far less than 1% of the total biomass on earth. And yet that's really the basis that we have in, in these metabolic rate measurements for trying to extrapolate to our entire biosphere. So I wanna um, change the view here, keep the same data set, but change the view a little bit. So for each individual point on this plot, I'm gonna take its metabolic rate, divide it by its biomass, and then we have the quantity mass specific power, right? So each one of these points now represents how much energy supports how much mass. And so effectively what, what I've done here is expand in order to show the detail um, and, and the scatter of these different measurements. So here again, you see the concentration on animals. You see these um, trends within taxa much more clearly. So a, a sublinear scaling of metabolic rate with biomass. Um, but now this becomes interesting because now you can have a look at what's typical. So the gray shaded region and the black line, um, this represents the geometric mean among all organisms. The gray shaded region is, is one standard deviation, uh, about five-fold standard deviation in this case. And a very large majority of these points um, plot within this gray shaded region, but not all. Uh, if you look at these points, you see about three and a half to four orders of magnitude range represented here. And that's important because if you're trying to figure out on another world, you know, I have this amount of energy available, uh, how much mass will that support? You'll get a much different answer depending on whether you take this value of MSP or this value of MSP. And the problem actually gets a little bit worse. So I mentioned that, that almost everything that appears in this plot is a basal metabolic rate measurement, um, which means measured under these very specific conditions. But if we take measurements um, of what's been seen when organisms are made to work at their maximum rate of energy throughput, now you see a cluster of points here that represent higher rates for, for birds and mammals, and even higher still for bacteria. So these are all bacteria that, that grow with a doubling time of about half an hour to 20 minutes or something like that. Um, similarly, if you take stock of the literature uh, that looks at metabolic rates in deep marine sediments, so none of these are specific to, to individual organisms, and that's why they're not um, uh, plotted directly on the plot. But if you take those measurements, the implication is that mass specific power for those organisms in some cases goes all the way down to about 10 to the minus seven on this scale. So now what we have is potentially eight orders of magnitude of, of dynamic range with respect to microorganisms from here to here. And that range narrows, the envelope narrows as you move across to animals where you have about four and a half to five orders of magnitude represented. So that's a lot, right? That's a lot of physiological potential that's represented in this environment. Um, that to me represents the starting context now uh, for what we can say about uh, mass specific power at the biosphere level, right? This is a statement about physiological potential. Now we wanna think about the biosphere level. So here's the first place where my, my inability to present gets me in a little bit of trouble. But um, what we did, the main focus of this study was to, to put together a power budget for the biosphere by which I mean for each individual set of organisms um, or, or each class of organisms. So in this case, for example, terrestrial primary producers have a total biomass globally of about 450 petagrams of carbon. 
Um, you can look and say similar things for marine primary producers. So we did this analysis for the terrestrial biosphere, primary producers and, and consumers of that primary production for livestock, humanity, and soil biota. We can do a similar thing in the marine biosphere, looking at primary producers. These are pelagic phytoplankton. We can look at all pelagic biota. Um, I see uh, I've pictured fish here, but, but this part of the biosphere is largely microorganisms. We can also do it for two layers of the sediment column, um, the zero to 10 centimeter sediment interval and uh, deeper sediments. And the reason for making this distinction is largely that um, this part of the sediment column experiences oxygen influx. It hosts animals that burrow and overturn. It's a much more active portion of the sediment column. This portion of the sediment column is distinctly different. Typically there's no oxygen, there are no animals, and this is a much different environment. And so um, I'm going to see if I can actually do something on the fly here. Um, maybe this will work and maybe it won't. There we go. Um, so for primary production, we've actually uh, looked at two different quantities. The first quantity is photon capture. So this is simply a measure of how much energy is represented in all of the photons that are captured and usefully harnessed into photosynthesis for both terrestrial primary producers and marine primary producers, a total energy capture of about 2,800 terawatts um, between these two organisms. The second quantity is autotrophic respiration. So when photosynthesizers do their thing, they store some of the fixed carbon as sugar and they can respire that sugar later in order to drive their energy metabolism. So autotrophic respiration worth about 80 terawatts of energy to global terrestrial primary producers, about 90 terawatts of energy um, uh, for marine primary producers. And there's one really interesting thing to look at here right away, which is that marine primary producers have about one one thousandth the mass of terrestrial primary producers, but capture a nearly equivalent amount of energy. And so that's a first indication that mass specific power is going to vary quite a bit across these different components of the biosphere. Um, so now let me see if this works. There we go. Um, so now uh, we've captured energy into photosynthesis, we've packaged it into organic matter, and when those organisms die or senesce, that organic matter becomes available to, to fuel a, cons a, a community of consumers. So we've been able to look at the mass specific power or the, the power available now to livestock, about four terawatts, humanity, about one, soil biota, 50 terawatts. So the majority of the flux of organic matter from here is fueling productivity here. We do the same thing in the marine biosphere, um, and now we go down almost by order of magnitude more in every step. So from 1200 terawatts in, in the photosynthetic community at the surface, 57 terawatts for ocean pelagic biota overall, three terawatts in the upper 10 centimeters of the sediment column and 0.02 in the bottom part of the sediment column. And I really wanna focus your attention on, on the marine biosphere here because we see already five orders of magnitude in the amount of energy that's flowing through these different components of the biosphere. And I think it's a great backdrop against which to ask this question, how much energy supports how much biomass? Um, so I wanna, whoops, I wanna present this now in a little bit different way for you. So the same data that I just showed, those, those um, measures of power in the different components of the biosphere, now I'm gonna divide that power in each case for each of those components by the mass, the equivalent mass um, of those organisms. And so what I can do now is express the mass specific power for each component of the biosphere. So this is a similar kind of plot that I showed you with respect to organisms. It's carbon biomass on a log scale on the x-axis. It's mass specific power on a log scale on the y-axis. And just to orient you, I've taken the organism level mean and standard deviation from the, the, the organism plot, and I've put it right here. So this is the geometric mean among all those 29, uh, 2,900 different species. Here's the standard deviation. Um, so the first thing that we can do is put the biosphere on this plot. I think um, this is a completely independent measure now of mass specific power in the biosphere that's based on, on our estimate of energy capture independent estimate of mass in the global biosphere. And it's actually remarkably similar to the organism level mean. Um, so I think there's some comfort to be taken in that fact that, that those two quantities agree quite well. But now for each of the different components of the biosphere that I just showed you, um, we can do the same thing. And so terrestrial parts of the biosphere are represented by these green points. 
marine parts of the biosphere are represented by these blue points. And to me, there's an almost orthogonal behavior between the terrestrial biosphere and the marine biosphere. So here in the terrestrial biosphere, um, as energy availability decreases across this set of points, the mass represented in those different components also decreases um, by several orders of magnitude. But the behavior is very much different in the marine biosphere. In the marine biosphere, you see that these different components from primary producers, pelagic biota, upper 10 centimeters of the sediment column and all sediments beneath that really don't vary much in their mass. So, so there's less than tenfold variation in mass across all of these different components, even though the power flowing through them varies by more than five orders of magnitude. And what's distinct, I think, about the marine biosphere relative to the terrestrial biosphere is that the marine biosphere is dominated by microorganisms at every level. Um, even when we think about the water column, you know, the, the pelagic ocean, we think about uh, fish and whales and and uh, you know and jellyfish and all kinds of stuff. But but nevertheless, it's about 80% by mass microorganisms. And I think the fact that uh, you have mainly microbes in in the ocean biosphere is driving a lot of this behavior, right? That in spite of the very different energy flux flowing through these different components, their mass really doesn't vary um, too much. And I think that. Um, we can reinforce this notion by looking now with a set of point measurements made in a marine sediment. So here on the y-axis, we have depth below seafloor in, in meters. So the bottom of the plot is about one meter depth in the sediment column. Again, mass specific power on, on a log scale here on the x-axis. And now what this is, is a series of individual measurements where for each of these points, um, the total uh, metabolic energy was measured. The biomass of cells was independently measured and we ratioed the two to get mass specific power. So what you see here represented going down with depth and, and with depth in the sediment column, you can think of depth as representing both increasing age and also diminishing energy flux. So there's orders of magnitude more energy flowing through the sediments here in this layer than there is down at the bottom. And that's because as a population grows in, to accommodate this energy flux, it begins to chew up the organic matter and there's less and less left as you go down. And so the behavior that we see exhibited here really kind of echoes what we saw for the, the microbe dominated marine biosphere overall, where there's a continuum of mass specific power that's represented. As the energy goes down, the mass specific power goes down across a continuum of more than five orders of magnitude. And I think that's a really um, important aspect of the way the microbial biosphere works. And it's the part that we should be paying the most attention to when we think about life elsewhere, you know, for example, in these deep ice covered oceans. So I wanna go briefly back now to what may be the drivers of this behavior that we see. So again, there's very little difference in mass in, in these um, different components of the, of the marine biosphere, but a huge difference in how much energy flows through so how do we account for that difference? Well, one way is that we know that the turnover in this part of the marine biosphere is very, very high. So it's been independently estimated that the entire marine phytoplankton biosphere turns over on a time scale of about three to four days. That's amazing to me. Ocean-wide, all phytoplankton turn over on a time scale of about three to four days. We also know from point measurements made in deep sediments um, that the turnover of biomass or biomass carbon here is exceedingly low, um, many thousands of times lower than the turnover rate here. And so perhaps there is something to be taken um, from this seeming correlation, right? That, that the very high turnover here corresponds to a very high mass specific power. The very low turnover here um, corresponds to a much lower mass specific power. And so I wanna explore that relationship just a little bit more. And in order to do it, <clears throat> I'm going to introduce two new quantities. And I put new quantities in quotes because they're really not terribly new. They're, they're um, quite similar to familiar concepts in, in microbiology for those of you who are, are microbiologists. Um, so the first of these is something I'm going to call specific carbon turnover rate or mu star. The idea behind specific carbon turnover rate is that it's the rate of biomass carbon turnover relative to the, to the quantity of standing biomass. So for example, if we have an organism with a mass of a kilogram and uh, 100 grams of that organism's carbon turnover on a daily basis, then it has a specific carbon turnover rate of 0.1 per day. 
So the units for specific carbon turnover rate would be something like, uh, for example, grams carbon turned over per gram carbon standing biomass per time, in this case, year. Um, and if you do the unit analysis, this simply reduces to units of reciprocal time. So in this way, it's directly analogous to the specific growth rate that we often refer to in microbiology, um, except that it accommodates all carbon turnover, not just net growth. And the importance of doing this, the, the reason for introducing this quantity is that it acknowledges that carbon turnover occurs within individuals and, and, and incurs an energetic cost, even when the organism grows slowly or not at all. And that's true of organisms and populations both. So this is a way of understanding energy that goes toward biosynthesis, even in non-growing individuals or populations. And just to give you a sense of why that's important, um, you can do a simple thought experiment with regard to people. So taken at the organism level, um, people have a turnover rate on the order of uh, 10 to the minus two per year. So meaning many decades, 70, 80, 90 years, something like that for the average turnover rate of, of organisms. But the carbon, the organic carbon within people turns over at a much higher rate. So independent measurements have been made that suggest that we turn over our entire protein pool on a time scale of about four per year. So just a few months to turn over our entire protein pool. And if you only focused on the organism level turnover, you would lose you would neglect all of the energy that's going to support this carbon turnover. And so that's the reason for introducing this specific carbon turnover rate. <clears throat> the second quantity I wanna introduce is the biosynthesis yield, which I'm calling here Y star. So this is very analogous to the, to the microbiology uh, quantity of growth yield, which is usually denoted as Y with two exceptions. The first is here we're considering just as with the specific carbon turnover rate, we're considering total biosynthesis, all carbon synthesized, rather than just net growth for exactly the reason that I just indicated. Um, we want to be able to attribute the cost of any biosynthesis, not just net growth um, to MSP. The second is that, <clears throat> that whereas the growth yield is typically expressed on a substrate basis. So for example, um, one gram new growth per 10 grams of substrate per, per day or something like that. Here we're expressing the cost of that biosynthesis on an energetic basis um, in units of watts, for example. And the reason to do this is that it allows comparison across diverse organisms. Suppose that I eat one thing and a different organism eats another thing. Now, in, instead of an apples to oranges comparison uh, by, by considering the cost on a substrate basis, we consider it on a common basis of watts. Um, how many, how many watts are available in consuming that substrate? How much new biomass does that yield? So it allows us to compare across diverse organisms, mixed populations, different substrates, and all the way up to the biosphere, um, comparing individual organisms against components of the biosphere. So this would have units of something like grams carbon synthesized per kilojoule of energy. And if you think about it, if you think through the unit analysis, um, if you take the specific carbon turnover rate, so grams carbon per gram carbon per year, and you divide it by mass specific power, um, which is something like joules per time per gram carbon, you get this quantity of Y star. And so there's a very simple relationship here between specific carbon turnover rate, mass specific power, and this Y star value, the specific um, the biosynthesis yield. So now I wanna actually explore this. Um, I think it, it wouldn't be revelatory to anyone to think that um, biosynthesis is a major driver of cost uh, or, or that energy is largely channeled toward biosynthesis in organisms. But there are lots of different things that an organism can do with energy that doesn't result in biosynthesis. I can go for a run, for example, and I burn lots of energy. Not, not much of it is going towards biosynthesis, if any at all. So I wanna explore how well these things are correlated over the very large range of mass specific power that we um, look at in the biosphere. And so just to orient you a little bit, here's mass specific power on the x-axis, again, in a log scale. Now here's this quantity specific carbon turnover rate, mu star in units of, of year to the minus one, also on a log scale. And the two dashed lines that you see here, so, so I'm not the first one to think about this, this y star quantity um, the biosynthesis yield in energetic terms. There was a, a really nice paper from uh, 25 years, 25 plus years ago, that looked at large numbers of different organisms um, 
looked at their biosynthesis yield <clears throat> and expressed it on a, on a power basis, so on, on a unit of, of um, grams carbon per kilojoule. And so what you see here in these two lines are constant values of Y star representing, in this case, the average among all aerobic heterotrophic cultures, and in this case, the average among all anaerobic heterotrophic cultures that are represented on this plot. Um, and, and in both cases, it's dozens of different organisms consuming many different substrates that are represented. So if mass specific power and biomass carbon turnover rate were perfectly correlated, it would plot here as a straight line on this plot. Um, and if they uh, maintain something like the biosynthesis yield that is seen in these different cultures uh, of organisms, you would see those points come out somewhere in this range. And so I want to actually do that analysis. Um, what I'm plotting now are anywhere that I could find independently measured um, quantities of mass specific power and specific carbon turnover rate for given organisms. So first I wanted to look at cultures um, where this uh, set of analyses has been done. So what you see up here in the diamonds, these are these very fast growing aerobic glucose oxidizing cultures here. Um, in these, uh, in these triangle points, these are methanogens. There was a really nice study from Alfred Sporman's group a couple of years ago that took the same organism and, and grew it at growth rates that range down to about 1% of its optimal growth rate. So that's what this set of points represents. And these are sulfate reducers in particular, these are psychrophilic sulfate reducers. So their rates were very low depressed because of the, um, the very low temperatures. So, so far so good, right? In these individual cultures, even spanning these, these three or four orders of magnitude, we see a very nice correlation. But what happens when we go out to the environment? So now I've added two natural systems to this plot. The first is a set of um, soil carbon measurements. So this is from Spohn et al in 2016. Um, these are measurements made in forest and pasture soils down with depth. And so again, they array themselves over about an order and a half or more of magnitude and mass specific power, but still this correlation holds up. Um, so these plot fairly, fairly well along the aerobic line, which I think is about what you would expect. Down here, these are measurements of, of uh, carbon turnover rate and mass specific power that are made in deep marine sediments. And when I say deep marine sediments in this case, I mean sediments ranging from one meter below sea floor to 40 meters below sea floor on the Peru margin. So these are extremely energy poor uh, systems that are represented here. And nevertheless, over all of that range, um, you actually see that this correlation between mass specific power and specific carbon turnover rate holds up quite well. Um, so that's kind of comforting. It suggests that if we understand something about the mass specific power or can make an independent estimate of, as we have for the different components of the biosphere, we can also make a statement about the carbon turnover rate in those parts of the system. And so for three of the components of the biosphere in which we um, made estimates of mass specific power, there have been independently published estimates of the specific carbon turnover rate. So those three are marine primary producers, which then plots out here, humanity, which plots out here, and terrestrial primary producers, which plots out here. And so I find it kind of remarkable actually that, that these completely independent measures um, of, of uh, energy throughput and mass specific power at the biosphere level, nevertheless correspond very well to this, to this uh, correlation that is established firstly by cultured organisms, secondly by point measurements made in individual environments, and, and lastly um, in our whole biosphere level metrics. And so that's kind of interesting because it suggests that, that, you know, that the very good correlation that's represented here becomes predictive. Um, and predictive in the following sense. So there were several components of the biosphere for which we made estimates of mass specific power where independent estimates of carbon turnover rate haven't been made, but our correlation, right? If, if this correlation holds up across these different components of the biosphere allows us now to, to estimate the specific carbon turnover of those pools on a global basis. So we see now we can put the entire pelagic biota here on the plot um, this assumes that it, it uh, operates with a Y star that falls within this range that, that all the other points do. Um, globally, soils sit about here, upper 10 centimeters of the sediment column here, and bottom of the sediment column, all sediments beneath 10 centimeters here. Um, 
And I think this is pretty remarkable because if you think about it, you know, anything that causes energy to be spent on something other than biosynthesis would cause a divergence from correlation on this plot. And in particular, as you get to very, very low levels of energy throughput, very low mass specific power, um, it's easy to believe that there are other things, for example, simply spending energy to maintain charged membranes, uh, as an example, that could divert power away from biosynthesis. And yet, over the something like eight plus orders of magnitude that are represented in this plot, um, this relationship holds up very well. And so I think that's quite interesting. So I wanna now um, try to bring all of this together because this, is, this has been an empirical look at how things work on earth, but I started this, this talk with the premise that we were gonna try and use that as a jumping off point to say something about, um, about how life might work elsewhere, right? What's the right conversion factor to use to take an estimate of energy availability on one of these worlds and turn it into a, an, an assessment of biomass. And so I'm gonna apologize in advance. The next slide is gonna look really horrific when it comes up um, because of the inability to work in presenter view, but, but we'll do our best. Um, so here's my stab at synthesis. Uh, we have seen through our individual measures of mass specific power in the biosphere that across the microbe dominated components in particular of Earth's marine biosphere, the expressed mass specific power ranges over more than five orders of magnitude in continuum. And I mean, in a way that's kind of dismaying because if the notion of doing this analysis is to try to say something about what's the right conversion factor to use when, when thinking about how energy translates to life on other worlds, this is decidedly unhelpful, right? To, to say that it's a five order of magnitude range of possibility. On the other hand, if that's the observed reality, that's important to acknowledge. But I think all hope is not lost. Um, and in particular, I would say that neither of the extremes that we see represented in our biosphere is realistic for an entire biosphere elsewhere. And that's a speculative statement, right? The first part of the statement that we see these five orders of magnitude expressed, um, that's simply a statement of reality. But the notion that neither extreme is realistic, this is speculation. And so I want you to take what I say next as, as kind of a starting point for future work. So let's start with marine primary producers, um, which bring about 1200 terawatts of power into the biosphere and have a mass specific power of 2.3 um, watts per gram carbon. So of course, if we're in a photosynthesis, photo, photosynthesis independent environment, if there's no sunlight, there's no photon capture, and this goes away as a possibility. And I think that's important because photon capture is unique in, in the mechanistics of how photosynthesis works and why that requires organisms um, to capture a lot of photons in order to drive a relatively modest amount of carbon biosynthesis. So that part I think is, is not reasonable. Similarly, the measure of autotrophic respiration in these populations, what's important to realize I think about the phytoplankton population is that they don't simply exist in isolation. It's not its own complete total global biosphere. Right. As these organisms are chewed up by predation within the upper water column, it reduces organic matter, um, uh, dissolved and particulate organic matter that becomes available to the rest of the biosphere. And as that energy flows downward and outward, it becomes more diffuse and it fuels lower and lower levels of mass specific power all the way down to the sediment column. And so I think that you, you can't ignore that productivity in a very fast moving group like phytoplankton will trickle down to other organisms and this will lower the, the overall, the average mass specific power of the whole group. Similarly, I think the bottom most part of the range that we observe, so this very low mass specific power that we see here is probably also not realistic. And I wanna call your attention back to this little plot that I showed earlier of mass specific power versus depth. So the three lines that I have represented here, this is the average for the global pelagic biota for the upper 10 centimeters of the water column, uh, of the sediment column rather, and for everything beneath 10 centimeters. And so this value here corresponds to this part of the sediment column. And that's important because in order for this sediment to have organisms that finally reach this level of mass specific power that represents the global average, this represents about 2000 years worth of sediment accumulation. Remember I said, you can think of age as being comparable to depth. So what's really happened here is that you had um, an input of organic matter that was colonized here at the surface 
built as large a community as could be supported by that, that input of organic matter. And then the amount of energy available decreased and decreased and decreased by orders of magnitude over the course of 2000 plus years. That's the depth that's represented here. And it's only that very slow adaptation to, to starvation essentially that has allowed this community to finally reach this very low value of mass specific power. So for that reason, I think it's also unreasonable to, to think about these very low levels as being applicable to an entire biosphere. Heterogeneity in energy sources is almost unavoidable uh, in cases like this. And I think the, the, the instant that you introduce hotspots um, of heterogeneity, for example, a hydrothermal vent representing locally higher energy flux, um, you will bring up the global average. And so if I were put on the spot right now, I would say that perhaps the, the reasonable numbers that we should be bearing in mind for mass specific power for this conversion factor between energy flux and biomass lie somewhere in this range, somewhere that we see represented in the sediment column between the upper portion and the lower portion. And to be fair, there's still um, uh, you know, 40 to 50 fold variation represented between these two. So that's a large range, but it's way better than the five orders of magnitude that we see represented in the biosphere overall. So just to wrap up, um, you know, one of the neat things about this project is there were a hundred different little rabbit holes to go down uh, in this project. And I'm going to spare you 99 of them, but I'll subject you to one that I thought was particularly interesting um, and particularly brought a lot of perspective for me. Um, you know, in, in metabolic terms, in physiologic terms, we humans are wholly unremarkable in reference to the all organism geometric mean. Um, we're almost identical, in fact, to the all organism geometric mean uh, of mass specific power. So, so we're entirely average with respect to those 2,900 species that we looked at. Um, we're also within a factor of two of the entire global biosphere average. Um, we're completely average in that respect. And our number is actually spot on with respect to marine pelagic biota, um, which again is mostly microorganism. So, you know, metabolically, there is nothing special about us. And I think that makes perfect sense. But we're the only species, as far as I know, that also uses energy in technological terms. And you can find uh, British, British, excuse me, British Petroleum Corporation publishes annually a comprehensive assessment of, of utilization in technological terms by the community. And if you take this measure, right, if you combine together the energy that we consume in metabolism and through technology, globally, we consume about 18 times more energy in, in technology per person than we do in food consumption. And if you look at, at heavily industrialized nations, taking the United States as one example, that number goes up to more than 40 times uh, higher than, than we do metabolically speaking. And so that number, the resulting mass specific power, far exceeds any component of the biosphere except marine primary producers. And it's really noteworthy that, that the high level of mass specific power that's sustained in the marine biosphere is only sustainable, only achievable because the entire population turns over on a time scale of four days and therefore remains very small. Um, we do not, we have a very large population and nevertheless, we burn energy at this very high rate. Um, it turns out fortuitously that, that the mass specific power for the United States of about 0.52 watts per gram carbon is exactly equivalent to the mass specific power of a sprinting antelope. Um, so there's a picture to put in your head. Um, that's what we do with our utilization of energy. We are uh, globally a civilization of about 0.1 petagram biomass that is running at a rate equivalent to that of a sprinting antelope. And I think perhaps most interestingly to me is that humanity comprises only a very small fraction of Earth's total biomass, only about a hundredth of a percent of Earth's biomass. Nevertheless, we have through our activities nearly doubled the mass specific power of the entire biosphere. Um, it's about two times higher because we are here than it would be if we were not here. And that's primarily because we have imposed land use and land management changes that translate to very high carbon turnover rates. So um, by obligating the biosphere to turn over at a higher rate through cropping, through, through uh, you know, timber production, all of these kinds of things, um, we've had a measurable impact on, on the metabolic rate of our biosphere, the mass-specific biosphere, sorry, mass-specific power of the biosphere.
And so I think that's a good place to, um, to leave you in this talk. Um, I hope that brings a little bit of perspective for you. Um, it certainly did for me uh, in the course of doing this study. And so again, apologies for not being able to, to um, make the, the uh, animations work, but hopefully it wasn't um, too awful. So thanks very much. I hope that was, I hope that was fun and interesting. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Holder, for again, for your presentation. And we do have a couple of questions uh, from the audience. So I'll go ahead and ask them uh, uh, in addition. To, so again, if you have any questions, please feel free to share them in the chat. Um, and in addition, there are some comments for uh, for you that I'll leave there for you to read. Uh, so the first question is, would you say that photon energy from the sun is more critical to sustaining life or is it the resulting heat? For example, tidal heating that can uh, warm a distant moon in the outer solar system to the point of liquid water, but not have solar energy, could that be sufficient to harbor life? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So, so um, importantly, I think you can think of solar energy in, in the two ways just mentioned, right? One is direct utilization of, of that energy. The other is not only in keeping liquid water, um, uh, keeping water liquid, for example, but also in driving circulation of that liquid through a silicate crust. So for example, our internal heat production, or you could also have, have uh, tidal heat production, um, causes the planet to wanna get rid of its internal heat. And part of the way that we do that on earth is to circulate cold seawater through hot rocks. Um, that process, the reaction that, that ensues um, is what gives us our, our uh, reductant rich hydrothermal vents. So the water equilibrates with the rocks, comes out with, with um, uh, a bunch of reductant power. So um, if you think about it in that way, you could, you could think about that process of trying to turn heat energy into biologically usable energy, for example, in, in um, uh, reductants that can then be um, respired. That process, even on Earth, uh, where I think our, our heat dissipation works very well, is actually quite inefficient. So, it, so we, um, ocean-wide, have about 30 terawatts of, um, of heat flux that comes out from, from our planet. Um, the amount of reductant flux is about 30 gigawatts. And so we convert that heat energy in, into biologically usable energy with an efficiency of only about 0.1% or so. Um, so I think that um, having sunlight directly accessible to life is, is, gives you an energy source like no other. Um, I think you would, if you did the mental experiment of dropping the solar flux um, and, and therefore the light energy that was available to Earth, you would freeze our planet solid long before you would begin to impinge on, on the light energy requirements of our biosphere. Um, so I really do think that, that almost anywhere you go, you're going to be faced with this many orders of magnitude difference between what the sun gives you or a star gives you versus what a, a, a light-free um, system can give you. Thank you. Uh, the next question that we have uh, from the audience is, has there been a study on what the power consumption, um, excuse me, what the power consumption is for a single bacterial cell in terms of watts per cell? I imagine that'd be pretty difficult to measure. Yeah, so the simple answer is, I don't know whether anyone has tried to, has tried to do that at, at the level of a single cell. Um, you know, typically we, the, the measures that I showed, typically what other people have done um, are based on uh, whole cultures, uh, in which case you're, you're measuring the bulk energy utilization rate and, and dividing by the cell number or the biomass or something like that. Um, I'm not aware whether individual organism, whether, whether that measurement has been made on individual organisms. And it would be very interesting to see um, how much variability there is, even in something that is notionally, uh, you know, a, a homogeneous population. Um, nevertheless, I, I think there, there are multiple studies to show that lots of quantities um, vary in a heterogeneous fashion. And I think there's every reason to expect that it would be similar in the case of, of energy utilization. Thank you. And then another question that we have, uh, isn't it possible that the correlation between the mass specific power and biomass might just be because life evolved that way? Anything that didn't correlate to MSP died out billions of years ago. So if life evolved, excuse me. So if life evolved differently somewhere else, it could show a completely different correlation, no? Uh, 
Um, it's a good question. I, I think that, you know, I, I have referred to it in the paper and here as a correlation rather than imputing any causality to it. Directionality, is it mass specific power that drives biomass carbon turnover or the other way around? Um, in, in particular, I think a lot of what you see represented in that correlation, particularly at the high, ener at, at the high energy part of the spectrum, um, is the influence of ecology. So ecology and environment are both important throughout. Um, you know, uh, predation ecology, viral ecology, all of that matters. Uh, environmental conditions certainly matter throughout. But I think in particular at the very high energy part of the spectrum, taking marine phytoplankton as a perfect example, um, you know, you convert energy into biomass, you grow and grow, and, and soon you reach a level where um, it's appealing and, and a high return on investment um, to, to consume that population. And so now you have almost an external driver in, in predation ecology of what the mass specific power is. And, and really the correlation, I think, then becomes um, how conserved is that value of Y star? Um, you know, does a kilojoule of energy always give you more or less the same amount of, of um, biomass or not? And, and I think that in thinking about life elsewhere, that becomes a pretty interesting quantity to think about as well. Um, what is it? What is it that gives us the values, the relatively well conserved values of Y star that we have here? And how much can that quantity vary elsewhere? Great. Great. Thank you so much. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? And while I'm while I, <clears throat> excuse me, while I wait for any other questions from the audience, I do have a question myself. Sure. Um, so with your participation uh, with the uh, Mars Science Laboratory and, and with the uh, hopefully one day Europa Lander, um, can you speculate or share a little bit about how one would measure uh, these power consumptions uh, remotely or, or on other worlds? Um, I know that's kind of an out there question. Yeah, no, it's it's fine. So um, so I have mostly thought about, about the ability to make these measurements as supporting the kind of empirical assessment that I just described um, in order to be, a, to, to be able to then constrain our notions about how much biomass might be out there elsewhere. So I think about it as, as informing the way that we parameterize our search. Does it make sense to take an instrument that looks for standing biomass, a, a microscope, for example, something like that, in light of what we've learned? Whether to actually make those measurements elsewhere, um, you know, here, uh, often enough, those measurements are made in, you know, either by looking at substrate consumption rate and converting that into energy terms. So almost all of the animal physiology measurements that I showed you are based on oxygen consumption or CO2 production rate. Um, by looking at radio tracer based metabolic rates. So most of the sediment data and soil data that I showed you are done that way. Um, you know, or, or in some cases, uh, by calorimetry, by measuring the heat production and attributing that to, to the organisms. Um, whether you would choose to, you know, so theoretically, any of those are applicable to life elsewhere, whether you would choose to deploy them and try to measure um, mass specific power as a quantity or metabolic rate as a quantity, I think is, is a different question, right? I, I think you might look for other measures of, of um, presence of life before you would think about starting to, to do those kinds of measurements. With that said, um, you know, one thing that life does well is make reactions go much faster than they would if life were not present. And so the ability to make some kind of rate measurement, um, even if not a direct metabolic rate measurement, has been looked at by some people as a, um, you know, as, as a potential way to seek evidence of life. But I think any of those are possible. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, we do have a question and uh, we'll leave this as the last question, just in the interest of time, as we did. Uh, um, or actually, what we'll do is we'll ha we'll have Dr. Holler uh, respond to this question individually, if that's uh, sorry outside of this, uh, just for the sake of uh, uh, respect for everyone's time. Uh, sure. Now that with that being said, again, everyone, thank you. Uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Holler uh, in joining us for this uh, presentation today. I am with uh, starting off our Life uh, Research Coordination Network seminar series. We do invite you uh, to visit our website, liferCN.org, or follow us on Twitter at life underscore RCN. Uh, 
And you can also check out our YouTube channel where uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, we'll publish this, uh, we'll, we'll have posted this, uh, this presentation. Uh, in addition to that, I do invite you all to join us uh, back here again on June 5th uh, with a presentation from, uh, why am I forgetting, um, from Dr. Maria uh, Rebolleda Gomez from uh, the University of California. And with that, thank you so much, everyone. And uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.